Good morning, nice to see you all. I hope you're staying safe and well. In today's video tutorial, we are focusing on chapter seven of Jekyll and Hyde by Robert Louis Stevenson, uh, The Incident at the Window. Uh, it's another short chapter, uh, so make sure you've read it in advance uh, because we're gonna do a close reading of a certain passage from that chapter, not read the whole thing. Um, it's a very crucial chapter in terms of the plot of the novel. It's another chapter in which Stevenson gives the reader a rather large clue about what's really happening in this story. Remember for a first time reader that we are still unsure as to what the relationship is between the eminent Dr. Henry Jekyll and the criminal he uh, Edward Hyde. So we're, so we're starting to piece together perhaps uh, the story. I'll show you a summary of the chapter first and then we'll go straight into a close reading uh, of this chapter. So I'll see you shortly. Okay, so we're going to focus on the latter half of this page and then the description of Jekyll at the window and I'll, we'll perform a close reading of this chapter. So I'm going to start from the court was very cool and damp. The court was very cool and a little damp and full of premature twilight, although the sky high up overhead was still bright with sunset. The middle one of these three windows was halfway open, sitting close beside it, taking the air with the infinite sadness of Mien like some disconsolate prisoner, Utterson saw Dr. Jekyll. What? Jekyll? he cried. I trust you are better. I am very low, Utterson, replied the doctor drearily. Very low. It will not last long, thank God. You stay too much indoors, said the lawyer. You should be out here, uh, whipping up the circulation like Mr. Enfield and me. This is my cousin, Mr. Enfield, Dr. Jekyll. Come, now, get your hat and take a quick turn with us. You are very good, sighed the other. I should like to very much, but no, no, no. It is quite impossible. I dare not. But indeed, Utterson, I am very glad to see you. This really is a great pleasure, and I would ask you and Mr Enfield up, but the place is really not fit. Why then, said the lawyer good-naturedly, the best thing we can do is to stay down here and speak with you from where we are. That is just what I was about to venture to propose, returned the doctor with a smile. But the words were hardly uttered before the smile was struck out of his face and succeeded by an expression of such abject terror and despair as froze the very blood of the two gentlemen below. They saw it but for a glimpse, for the window was suddenly thrust down, but that glimpse had been sufficient, and they turned and left the course without a word. In silence, too, they traversed the by-street, and it was not until they had come into a neighbouring thoroughfare, where even upon a Sunday there were still some stirrings of life, that Mr Utterson at last turned and looked at his companion. They were both pale, and there was an answering horror in their eyes. 
God forgive us! God forgive us! said Mr. Utterson. But Mr. Enfield only nodded his head very seriously and walked on once more in silence. So I'd like to start by discussing the simile which we are, which Stevenson uses to describe Dr. Jekyll, uh, trapped and imprisoned within his own home. So I'll read it out again for you. Taking the air with an infinite sadness of mien, like some disconsolate prisoner, Utterson saw Dr. Jekyll. And I think the simile is really important. Um, and, and the use of language is, is, is subtly interesting and useful. The fact that Jekyll is experiencing sadness, such infinite sadness. I think that the adjective infinite really emphasises the point. The fact that he seems to be suffering from an everlasting sadness is, is important. Of course, it creates that ambiguity for the reason of what's causing the sadness. Why is he, why is he experiencing such tremendous feelings of sorrow and sadness? Why does he look so dejected? Because his appearance seems to be one of hopelessness, despair and confinement. He's compared directly to a prisoner, a prisoner who cannot be consoled, a disconsolate prisoner. And again, what Stevenson does very skillfully is manipulates the reader through the use of ambiguity again, that, that idea of causing deliberate confusion. We, we are left wondering why he's sad uh, initially. And then we're left wondering why is he compared to a prisoner? Why is he imprisoned uh, within his own home? Why is he confined? So there's a sense of confinement, there's a sense of misery, and we don't know the answer as to why he feels that way. That's if you're a first-time reader, of course. If you're not a first-time reader, and we're reading this as, though, uh, you know, as, as people who know the plot of Jekyll and Hyde, we know that, uh, that Jekyll at this point of the novel uh, has lost control of his ability to transform into Hyde. Uh, so he therefore can't leave the house. He's a prisoner within his own home because he can no longer control when he transforms into Hyde. And of course, it's worth remembering that Hyde, from chapter four onwards, is a wanted murderer who will be, would be hung at the gallows if he were to be caught. So Jekyll is a prisoner within his own home because he has lost control of the ability to transform, because he is uh, a wanted criminal. And he needs to, uh, and by keeping himself confined to his house, he of course escapes the law. Remember that Jekyll is almost like, uh, well, later in the novel, he's compared to being a cavern that a mountain bandit hides in. So if you think about, here's my cavern, uh, here's my ma mountain bandit escaping and running towards the cavern. In this metaphor, which is used in chapter 10, the cavern is Dr. Jekyll, he's the hiding place, and the mountain bandit is Mr. Hyde. And Hyde uses Jekyll as a refuge. And Jekyll now has to use his own home as a refuge because he is uh, unable to control this transformation. So he's imprisoned within his house. And we talked earlier in a, in a previous lesson about how the house becomes a metaphor for his psyche. Uh, remember, this entire novel is concerned with human identity and the human mind, and particularly the unconscious. And... Jekyll has to imprison his evil or his or his sub I, I suppose we could say he imprisons his unconscious self within his own house and his house uh, represents his you know the Victorian gentleman the super ego as it were so if we're going to read it from a Freudian angle again we would say that Jekyll is trying to desperately control his id and Hyde who was earlier the mountain man is the id remember the id is the, the base desires, the impulses, the pleasure principle that all of us have, but most of us are, are, are able to control either through our ego or through the super ego, which is the voice of our society and the voice of our parents and morality. So Jekyll is a disconsolate prisoner because his, his life is in danger, because he can no longer control his transformations. Um, and frankly, because just like a prisoner, he is receiving a punishment, so he also becomes a Promethean figure. Uh, and we remember that Prometheus is linked to that myth of forbidden knowledge. Jekyll is being punished for breaking the laws of nature. Okay, we then have the description of what the exchange rather between Utterson and Jekyll. And Jekyll responds to Utterson's, you know, I trust you are better by saying, I'm very low, very low. It will not last long, thank God. And again, 
the ambiguity permeates throughout, frankly, the whole novel, but especially this chapter. What does he mean when he says very low? What, why, is he, why is he very low? What's caused him to feel this sense of misery and despair? I think the low signifies perhaps the symbolism of his descent. He's experienced a fall. He's fallen from grace. He's fallen from uh, virtue into sin. Uh, he's falling towards damnation, perhaps. So he's low, he's in a low mood, he's depressed, uh, he's trapped and imprisoned. And then he gives us this vague, you know, idea of, of essentially, it's an example of foreshadowing. But he says kind of vaguely, it will not last long, thank God. So he hints at his life coming to an end, just like Lanyon did earlier in the novel. But again, of course, we want to know why does he think that and how does he know that? Um, he then says later on, you know, I dare not come outside with you. Um, and he never explains why. He, 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 he says it's quite impossible. The place is not really fit. He gives these kind, essentially these lame excuses about why he can't go on a walk with Utterson and Lanyon. And, and as a first time reader, we would be unsure about why he can't leave. Uh, knowing the story, knowing the plot, we know it's because he is liable to transform into Hyde at any moment at this point, um, which we discover more about in chapter 10. So we'll, we'll go into this idea of Jekyll's lack of control in chapter 10 in the lessons we focus in chapter 10. We then have the most important aspect of the chapter, which is, of course, the incident itself. And the way that Stevenson frames these chapters is always fairly vague, always used to create mystery and suspense. So this vague incident at the window, the, the incident is finally revealed right at the end of the chapter. And I'll read out the description again. The words were hardly uttered before the smile was struck out of his face and succeeded by an expression of such abject terror and despair as froze the very blood of the two gentlemen below. They saw it but for a glimpse, for the window was instantly thrust down, but that glimpse had been suffi sufficient, and they turned and left the court without a word. In silence, too, they traversed the, the by streets, and it was not until they had come into the neighbouring thoroughfare, where even upon a Sunday there were still some stirrings of life, that Mr Utterson at last turned and looked at his companion. They were both pale, and there was an answering horror in their eyes. God forgive us, God forgive us. And what's in interesting here, again, I would say it's the ambiguity, uh, which I'll discuss in more detail as we, when we get to it, I suppose. Um, clearly, the incident is that Utterson and, Lanyard, Utterson and, and Enfield, rather, they witness Jekyll beginning to transform back into Hyde. But crucially, we're never told, Stevenson never reveals exactly what it is that they get a glimpse of. He just repeats this word glimpse uh, to create ambiguity, suspense and tension. But really, th there is the mystery. Well, what did they see? What exactly did they gl get a glimpse of? But clearly what they do get a glimpse of is utterly horrific. Um, look at the language here. Uh, the smile was struck out of Jekyll's face. There's a kind of a violence to that description, a, a violence to that verb. This idea that Jekyll is suddenly uh, completely un undone, completely stripped of any feelings of happiness by this sudden change. It's the suddenness of the change that is frightening. And of course, it, it implies later on in the novel, it implies a lack of control, which is what causes Jekyll so much terror. He cannot, he can no longer simply drink the elixir and transform back. He no longer, he can no longer tell when he will wake up as Hyde, when he'll wake up as Jekyll, when he'll be either character. So really, later on we find out that this chapter is really about the fact that he's losing control of his identity. But the descriptions are so violent. We have the struck out of the smile, we have the description of the abject terror and despair uh, in his expression. And these adjectives are incredibly powerful and again, incredibly vague. What's causing Jekyll to feel terror? Why does he feel such despair? We know now it's because of the fact that this sudden transformation has occurred to him without his control. So he's lost that self-control. Uh, he's, being, he's being overwhelmed by the power of Hyde in a sense. Because we, again, we later on find out that this novel is, well, the, what, that what happens in the novel is Jekyll and Hyde are, are essentially battling for supremacy in Jekyll's own mind. So it's a battle between his unconscious and his conscious self, in a sense. And then what they, they it becomes quite gothic. We have the description as of the freezing of the very blood, kind of almost a classical gothic description. Um, but crucially, 
Stevenson skillfully uses that ambiguity to maintain the or, or the, the reader's sense of curiosity because we don't know what has caused the gentleman below to feel so terrified what have they seen exactly that is so horrific and of course what they're actually seeing is a man transforming into another man and this it would be utterly terrifying because it would break the natural the natural laws it would go against god's kind of the, the order of the universe it would be a horrifying and monstrous sight but we don't know that at this point. Stevenson is using the ambiguity skillfully to, to keep that information from us. Like I said before, we have this, the, the word glimpse being repeated a, a number of times so that we get an impression of, well, we get a sense that they get an impression of what they see, but we don't get a firm description. It's a, it's a, it's a fleeting image and we don't get to see it. So it's very frustrating for us as readers. The window was instantly thrust down. We talked a lot previously about how windows and doors are symbols for identity in this novel. And the fact that he thrust the window down represents, again, his, his attempt to maintain secrecy, to maintain privacy. Um, and also, frankly, look at the verb choices, thrust down. It also represents the fear that Jekyll has. And remember, why would Jekyll be fearful? Well, logically, he's fearful because he is transforming into a known and wanted murderer. So he knows that he would be uh, caught by the police and possibly hung for murder. He's probably he's possibly fearful because his friends would uh, abandon him. He's, he would be his his reputation would be lost. Um, so there are numerous things that would cause Jekyll to feel such terror and fear. What is then fascinating, what I've always found fascinating about the characters in this novel is how they react to these incredulous scenes, how they react to these, you know, horrific scenes of violence or of, um, of gothic uh, tropes, which happened previously in the novel. And typically, once again, these Victorian gentlemen respond with silence. And I think the silence is deeply symbolic. I think it represents the code of conduct of the Victorian gentleman, the fact that you are, you are expected to maintain a stiff upper lip, you are expected not to uh, divulge in gossip and hearsay. So there's a kind of code of conduct or etiquette being followed by the two men. They don't mention what it is they've seen. They walk on until, until the neighbouring street without saying a word, which is, seems like incredibly bizarre behaviour to a modern reader. And when they finally do get the chance to maintain eye contact, uh, we get the sense that they've both seen something that is utterly traumatic, utterly horrific. Uh, they're described as being pale uh, with horror in their eyes. Again, classic Gothic uh, conventions being used by Stevenson. The, they've seen something that has unsettled them. And we're reminded of Lanyon, because Lanyon earlier on was described as being pale. He's, he said he's received a shock. And... Clearly, our characters here have received a shock too. But crucially, just like Lanyon, they are not naming what has caused them to feel the shock. All Utterson can say is, God forgive us, God forgive us. And it's incredibly, it sounds as, you know, like, a, like someone who's traumatised. It sounds like someone who's received a terrible shock. Um, it's full of fear, but it's also crucially full of ambiguity. Why did why do they feel the need for God to forgive them? What have they seen? Why are they so horrified? Why is, why does he call to God? I think it's interesting that he what he's seen is clearly something rather satanic and demonic. And we've talked about how Jekyll's experiment is arguably a Faustian one, uh, one in which he sold his soul to the devil uh, to to harness forbidden knowledge. And then Enfield, in response, doesn't even say anything. He just nods his head and walks on in silence. And that silence is repeated again. And we have this. You know, continuation of the theme of secrecy and privacy and the code of conduct, conduct of the Victorian gentleman. It's incredibly tantalising for the reader. We feel tantalised, we feel like we're, we're being tempted, we're being manipulated, we're being toyed with, um, but we're not being given the crucial information that we need. It's so, we're so close to being, or so close to discovering what's actually happening in this novel, but, but Stevenson is so skillfully using ambiguity to hold us at arm's length, to keep the mystery under wraps as we get to the end of the chapter.
welcome back. We've come to the end of today's lesson in which we've seen uh, Jekyll spiraling out of control. This is the beginning of the end of Dr. Henry Jekyll. He's imprisoned within his own home, uh, which serves, I, I believe, as a metaphor for his psyche. The fact that he is now uh, a man who is imprisoned within uh, the boundaries of his own mind uh, and at war with his unconscious self. We've seen the, the kind of permeation of themes such as secrecy and the Victorian gentleman's code of conduct. We've seen a lot of gothic tropes in the description of the incident itself. I'll see you next lesson when we'll start to look at the final chapter in the linear narrative. And I'll, just, I'll explain what that means next lesson, uh, which is chapter eight, the last night, um, ominously titled, I would, I would suggest. Uh, that, less, that chapter will divide into a series of different lessons before we look at the, penult the penultimate chapter, Dr. Lanyon's narrative, and then the final chapter, Jek Jekyll's statement of the case. So I'll see you next time. Stay safe and stay well. Goodbye.